All right, tactics explained. Uh, I've been looking forward to getting back into some tactical videos. Uh, I am an American football coach, and so one of my favorite things about getting into a new sport is learning uh, the tactics and learning the strategy behind the game. And this video looks interesting because it looks like it's going to go through the different eras of football from the 1800s on through today. So this will be interesting to see how tactics have evolved through history. Let's check it out. Modern football is composed of many different tactics. Some of the most popular ones right now are the high press used very successfully by Liverpool, Tiki Taka adopted by Manchester City Pep Guardiola, and switch and play which is common in teams like Ajax and Chelsea. Although it may seem like these tactics Jose have been Mourinho. around for a long time, they weren't always the meta. The meta, in the context of video games, are considered as the most effective tactics available. Ah, but when examining football, the meta has changed available. countless times. Okay. To truly understand how we got to where we are today, it will help to go back to the start. Mm. And by doing this, we can highlight how tactics that we use today have actually been seen countless times before. So let's go back. I actually just recognized a lot of those players. Let me back up. I remember just like two months ago doing a video where I couldn't name like most <laughs> of the football players. It's Messi, Ronaldo, this, how Lewandowski, have actually don't know this guy, times Ronaldinho. So let's go back to when Zidane, football was started to develop, the 1880s. The sport back then had a completely different look to that. This is my favorite era of football, example, by the way, guys. The 1880s. It wasn't really a thing, and it was common to just give it to the strikers. And each well, I, I, I just I enjoy watching the game where it is today, but it was fun to watch um, some of those videos just kind of of early football in the early landscape when it was just breaking onto the scene with the new rules and things like that. Uh, it's just fun to watch that. The history. I love history. I'm a nerd like that. Each player would take it in turns trying to break down the defending team. This was due to both the rules of the game being a lot more similar to those we see in rugby. Wait, pause. All right, when a player has kicked the ball, anyone of the same side who is nearer to the opponent's goal line is out of play and may not touch the ball himself nor in any way would ever prevent any player, other player from doing so until he is in play. Okay. A player is offside if he is in front of the ball. Okay, wow. And a lack of structure in how the game was played. However, this didn't stop teams from figuring out some tactics that helped them overcome their opponents. All right, let's pause it again. I'm sorry if it's going to be a long video, but I really want to read these slides. The offside rule originated in 1863. A player was considered offside unless three players of the opposing side are in front of him, includes the goalkeeper. So in the above diagram, the player with the ball is considered offside because only two players are in front of him. Okay, so that's that is a little different than the one that than the offside rule that we see today. Um, yeah, wow. Well. At the start, the most popular formations that we would see would probably look like this: a one-one-eight or a slightly more defensive one-two-seven. It took a Scottish team to revolutionise the game by introducing the idea of passing the ball to your teammates and overcoming the defence together. This ended up setting the pace for the next 30 years as teams started to develop and understand how to play. Let's move on to the 1920s. It was in this decade that an even more significant change to the offside okay, rule was made. Pause it again. Sorry. It's going to be a long video. The offside rule was changed in 1925. A player was considered offside unless two players... Oh, I just watched this. Oh, no, no. So it changed to two instead of three. This is closer to what we have nowadays. All right. Gotcha. And it took on a look that we are even more familiar with today. It was significant enough to change the meta once more, leading to more defensive formations such as a 2-3-5, which was the most common formation up until the mid-1920s. This change in formation allowed teams to still have five attacking outlets, but they were also more covered defensively with more support in midfield to stop the opposing team from overwhelming the defence. In fact, in the mid-1920s, teams started to develop more of a structure. Teams would have attacking set of players and a defensive set, usually five attacking, five defending. In the 1930s, the Austrian national team dominated the first half of the decade with a style of football that wouldn't be too out of place in the modern game. They were known as the Wunder team, and their foundations were built on quick passing. They were also the first team on record to adopt the concept of a false nine. While it was typical for strikers in this period to play off the shoulder of the defender, the Austrian striker would come deep and collect the ball outside the opposing team area, often leaving the two centre-backs twiddling their thumbs not knowing who to mark. One of the most significant formations that dominated the game for the next 20 to 30 years was the WM formation. 
It took this name due to the W shape that the strikers would create and the M that the defensive right. players would make. This allowed teams to have a high number of players up front and create chances but were never left too exposed at the back. That's interesting. This also allowed teams to develop specific numbers and names for each position. It was around this time that football tactics were starting to become even more important. Not much changed in the football world for the next 20 years, but in 1950, some big shakeups were coming. It's 1953, and England are going into a game against Hungary feeling pretty cocky. Little did they know, the Hungarians had the likes of Puskas in their team. The following game is known as the Game of the Century. The formation that the Hungarian team was century, called the wow. WW, revolutionary compared to the WM, which the majority of teams were still playing. This WW formation created an overload in midfield. The two uh. attacking midfielders would constantly be switching position, leaving the England players confused as to who they should be marking. However, it was the Hungarian striker coming deep to lay the ball off to the wide players that created the most amount of issues to England's back three. Wow. Hungary went on to win the game 6-3, a dramatic defeat for England, who suffered their first defeat at Wembley. In fact, the defeat was so dramatic so that cool this led England footage, to a complete man. overhaul of their tactics and changed the meta for the rest of the decade. 1960 In the 60s, football was starting to be seen on TV, opening the game up to a growing audience of people. Match of the Week started in 1964, and the World Cup in 1966 had the first televised game in colour. This was the decade of power football. Strong, physical players dominated defensive lines, and gave little room to attacking teams. An example of this can be seen in one of the most successful tactics of the period, the Catenaccio. Developed by Inter Milan coach Herrera, the word Catenaccio literally translates to doorbell. The Catenaccio way of playing football puts an emphasis on building a brick wall in front of goal and resorting to swift counter-attacks when the opposition overloads their attacking numbers. This formation also saw the use of a sweeper. The sweeper would clear the lines behind the back three. Not only was this formation defensively impeccable, the width created by fullbacks and creative free-roaming midfielders allowed Inter to dominate the domestic and European Cups for years. Huh. Catenaccio met its match in 1967 in the European Cup final against Celtic. Celtic won the game 2-1, and it was considered a victory for football because attacking football overcame Inter's defensive style. The 1970s brought with it even more changes and developments to the principles of the game. Teams like Brazil started to bring their tactics to the global stage, an example of which is the 4-2-4 formation, featuring the likes of Pele, Jarzinho, Gerson and Tostal. Mm. Now, although Brazil were not the first team to utilize this formation, they certainly were the most successful. One of the main features of the 4-2-4 formation was the use of attacking fullbacks that created width that teams were unequipped to deal with. The two holding midfielders gave freedom to the fullbacks to move up the pitch and have six attacking outlets up front. Mm. But the true meta right, of the 70s they can drop was back to be found defense. with Ajax. Ajax manager... Oh, Bruno it's called Ajax? I would have... Definitely, I definitely would have called that Ajax. All right. Michaels made history with one of the greatest teams of all time, with players like Johan Cruyff. The tactics that Ajax would use came to be known as total football. Total football. Any player. The beginning, play. the 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 um, inspiration for or the building blocks of Tiki Taka is total football. Any position and would rotate freely but structurally throughout the pitch. Defensively, the Ajax team would press high and close down the space as fast as possible, leaving little room for the opposing team to make any substantial plays. The 80s were known for going back to a defensive meta, similar to what we saw in the 1960s. This meant teams were hard to break down and would be clinical in front of goal. Teams were compact, with not much space mm. between the lines. Argentina and Germany were extremely successful in this decade for not taking unnecessary risks. The 1980s was still to offer a period which produced the likes of Diego Maradona, Michael Platini and Marco Van Basten to name a few. In club football, Arrigo Sacchi's AC Milan took the world by storm. The 4-4-2 formation was unanimous with the offside trap and probably the most aggressive offside trap the world has ever seen. Defensively, they played with a high line that limited the opposing team mm. to play within a space of about 25 ah. meters. By squeezing the opposition, a naturally occurring high press would take place, making it hard for the other team to move the ball in yeah. the space. I think I'm finally understanding the AC offside Milan trap. would play with a false nine and hit teams when they were unprepared with swift counter-attacks. 
the high press, high energy football played by Saki led the team to prolonged success in domestic and European cups. The 1990s were dominated by France and Brazil. Brazil played a 4 2 2 2. Similar That's to what we saw in the 1980s, they would attempt to attack with full backs. France, on the other hand, played with a 4 3 2 1, also known as the Christmas, Christmas tree. Formation. Three solid centre midfielders would. I would have called that the A spread because we had a um, American football formation when I was playing that was similar, a spread offense, and we called it A spread. Sit in front of the defence. The two more attacking minded midfielders were able to drop deep to collect the ball or attack the space behind the back foot. The meta in football, rather than favouring attack over defence, was finding that blending the two was proving mm. to be the way forward. And in club football, Sir Alex Ferguson's Manchester United team epitomised this mentality. This was the start of the dominating 4 4 2 formation. Although Man United lined up in a 4-4-2 on paper, it was arguably more of a 4-4-1-1, and the two strikers, often Cole and York, were key during this season, with one dropping deep and the other pressing the back four. On the attack, the fullbacks were key, providing right. width and a high number of attacking players. A key feature of the tactics of Sir Alex Ferguson was switching play. So, rapidly pause. Something that I'm noticing a lot is with these offense, offenses that your center backs are going to mostly hang back for defense but your full backs are often going to go forward into the formation to help with attacking um and so that's what i'm seeing so far um which is why i definitely probably would be playing center back <laughs> or um maybe a defensive midfielder i'm not sure but we'll see they attack the space on the other wing out of possession, they lined up in a tight 4-4-2 with little space between the defence and the attack, often pressing with two players to force the opposition to making mistakes. From 1992 to 2000, United won the Premier League six times, a highlight of which was the treble winning season in 1999. In the early 2000s, while Man United was still one of the strongest teams in the world, the meta was facing an impending change. The true story of the 2000s belongs to one man and the revolution he brought to English and European football. Jose, Jose Mourinho. Mourinho. I've heard about this. One key advantage that Mourinho had in his teams was an extra man in midfield, compared to the two common in the 4-4-2 formation. Jose would line up in a 4-3-3, with one defensive midfielder epitomised by Claude McAlaney and two more attacking midfielders including Frank Lampard mm. playing higher up and linking up with the lone striker, usually Didier Drogba. Chelsea and other Mourinho teams such as Porto, Inter and Real Madrid would often try and go long straight to the striker, often catching teams unprepared or not set up properly leaving lots of space in between the lines. Lampard or the attacking midfielder would attack the space behind the line of defence with the striker holding up play. The wingers mm. would run in behind and there would be plenty of outlets and creative freedom in yeah. this formation. Other than being incredibly clinical going forward, Chelsea had the best defensive season still yet to be matched, conceding only 15 goals and losing only one game. They only conceded 15 goals? That's wild. That's less than one a game, huh? The meta was rapidly switching to faster and more direct tactics that were proving to be hard to keep up with. The most recent decade has been home to some very exciting football. The number of different tactics that have achieved success seem to be growing as the teams become more and more efficient at playing countless variations and adapting to their opponents. Pep Guardiola's Tiki Taka also took the footballing world by storm. Quick close quarter passes designed to confuse opponents and overcommit to certain areas of the pitch led to the rise of one of the most successful managers of all time. More recently, mm. the last five years have seen a shift towards a meta more focused on extremely high energy football. Jurgen Klopp's Liverpool is a perfect example of this. Liverpool are renowned for their effective high press and fast movement on and off the ball. I love pressing. They're able to exploit space by using their fullbacks in Trent Alexander Arnold and Robertson. Excellent passer. Arnold while also is. being stable at the back, with Van Dijk at centre back and Allison in goal. 
Recently, they were crowned Premier League champions for the first time in 30 years and Champions League winners in 2019. So, we've seen football change drastically over the years, and more recently we've seen tactics from 40-50 years ago take the main stage once again. With this in mind, what do you think the meta will be in the next decade? Please leave your thoughts in the comments below, and if you like this content be sure to stick around. Bye for now. I'm not sure what the meta will be moving forward because I'm still trying to understand currently what the meta is. Um, this was a good, uh, a good video. I, I think that it's maybe a little more intermediate than I am currently. Uh, I'm, I'm tracking with a good bit of it, but um, it still moves pretty fast for me. So I still have to stop and pause and really think about the positioning and, and how the players are moving. But I think... Um, this was a really fascinating look at how the game has evolved since the you know the early eight, the, you know the 1800s and now um, to what it is today. Um, this was a great video. If you like what you see in this video and you like these types of videos, you'll probably like my other content. So you might as well subscribe to the channel, um, hit like on the video. It really helps me out. Um, and you also can support the channel financially if you want. There's super thanks that you can give on the video. There's also channel memberships that you can join just uh if you if you like my videos and you think hey that's a guy that if i was living near him in the states maybe once a week or maybe once a month or whenever i would pop in and buy him a cup of coffee then i'd appreciate it anyway uh, i'll see you guys in the next video